let me begin by welcoming everybody to another installment of the Queen's Podcast Lab Learning Series. My name is Joseph Cohen. I'm uh, in the Sociology Department at Queen's College in the City University of New York. And today I am thrilled to be uh, introducing my colleague, co-director of the Queen's Podcast Lab, uh, English professor and a respected scholar in the art of storytelling, Jason Tuga from uh, the Department of English here at Queen's College. And Jason, would you like to just uh, uh, kick it off? Get, get Absolutely. Started? Yeah. Thanks, Joe. So like Joe said, he and I are co-directors of the Queen's Podcast Lab. The, the lab operates from the sociology department of Queen's College here at the City University of New York. And for those of you joining us on the web, if you don't know anything about us, we're a collaborative of social science and humanities professors interested in the art and craft of content creation, but with a special focus on podcasting, though not exclusively. And part of what we do here is create learning experiences for people who are interested in being content creators or integrating content creation skills into the toolkit that they already have. Um, we also produce public domain scholarly podcasts um, and we have an internship that is a really cool experience for the right kind of student. Um, so that's just a little bit about us. I wanna say that um, this session is exciting to me because Joe has put together a great learning series and it's been fantastic to see more and more people from various programs and universities and walks of life joining the conversation as it, as it unfolds over the course of this fall semester. So that's been really nice. And today we're talking about storytelling. The, the emphasis today is gonna be on hooking, keeping and moving your audience. And, and by moving your, I mean moving in a couple of different senses, which I'll get to in a second. So this is, um, this is a short passage from a book I really love, Gabriel Starr's Feeling Beauty, The Neuroscience of Aesthetic Experience. And storytelling is one form of aesthetic experience. And I'm going to kind of make, uh, make a claim for storytelling based on what she argues about aesthetics in general. So uh, she, she argues the arts mediate our knowledge of the world around us by directing attention shaping perceptions and creating dissonance or harmony where none had been before. And what aesthetics gives us is a restructuring of value. So that's a fairly technical, uh, it's fairly technical language. Uh, a lot of cognitive and neuroscientific research on the arts and on narrative in particular suggests similar ideas. Um, basically that storytellers begin with some kind of familiar or shared knowledge or ways of thinking and then help or enable audiences to reshape perceptions, feelings, and beliefs. And one of the ways they do this formally is by playing with repetition and difference. And I, I want to look at some examples. So one, th one term I just want to add to the discussion, because it's very much about the way that, that narrative directs our attention, is anticipation. Anticipation is really key in storytelling. Um, I, I do want to say there is no single way to tell a good story. Um, I, I was raised by a family who loves their tall tales. And one thing about my family's storytelling, for first of all, it's all about ourselves constantly, but everybody starts with some shared kernel of experience that people remember, or at least have been told about quite a lot. And then every family member has a different version of it, right? And the variation is really key in terms of storytelling. And so flexibility has to be involved. Now, we can come back to STARS research and maybe some of its predecessors in terms of the field called neuroaesthetics a little bit later, but I wanna get practical and I wanna to get to audio storytelling right away. So, and, and I also just wanna mention that a really good interview or discussion-based podcast episode follows very similar principles of storytelling. Like if you're doing, you're really, aiming for good storytelling that's collaborative with you and another person. Um, I want to give you an example of 
of of this from a podcast where it's a discussion based podcast, an episode of Periodic Talks, which is hosted by Gillian Jacobs and Diana Reasonover, uh, both actors. And on this particular episode, the, in the second half of the episode, they have a guest, Roman Mars, who is the host of the podcast 99% Invisible. And they're having a discussion about uh, about the art of storytelling, really. Host and creator of the podcast 99% Invisible, Roman Mars. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Uh, 99% Invisible is one of my favorite podcasts. Uh, Deanna's heard me talk about it many Mm -hmm. times. (laughs) Um, I've listened to the show for years. I love it. Um, I try not to copy it on this, but be inspired (laughs) by it. Um, and I, I just love, I love, love, love your approach to storytelling and, um, how, engaged i feel listening to stories about design now because of your show oh it's so kind of you to say i appreciate it so i feel like you have really honed in on the art of storytelling with your podcast and not just that but telling stories about design in a human way it's something i'm still learning about how to tell stories in an oral Mm -hmm. medium and how to make technical stories feel human so we're so curious to hear about your process on the show, how you craft stories. And and we know that, you know, not all stories are the same. They can't have the same structure on the show. But it feels like you and your team find meaning in the smallest details. And those details really give shape to the incredible stories we hear on 99PI. How do you know which details are important and which ones matter? Hmm. Well, it- you're right. They do vary a lot. I mean, mainly it's just like you make the story you want to hear. So you look for the details that excite you that you would tell like at a bar or that you would just like pull out from the story and, and tell. Um, those usually aren't themes. They're usually not the most important thing necessarily, but they're they're just something that you're like, oh, that little detail that it decodes the world in an interesting way. And those are the ones that I gravitate towards as the as centering. And then when you're setting up a story, you're basically setting up a, a problem or something to be curious about. And then there's this, we call this thing called the turn, which is essentially like, um, well, to understand this, but first we need to go and tell you this history. Because the truth is, is that 99PI is a stealth history podcast. I mean, it really is just <laughs> telling you a, a story about how things got to where they are now. And then tries to look at, you know, kind of the cool and odd ways that you might not have thought about um, about this thing that is kind of every day to you and, and and trying to find delight in those things. And, you know, that that's been our mandate from the beginning. And, and people really like glommed onto that purpose, like very, very quickly in the show, like mm. as an audience, like the audience told me what the show was about as much as I decided huh. what the show was about. Wow. So we have a couple different clips that we want to play um, to familiarize our audience with them and also to kind of talk about them with you and figure out how it is that you build such an incredible podcast. So before every story on your show, the episodes all begin the same way. uh, And they begin sounding like this. This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. (laughs) You're laughing. Is it weird to hear your voice? (laughs) Oh, I've gotten so used to it. I used to hate my voice so much. And it took me forever to get used to it. Like seven years, I think, of broadcasting before I seven years. Really oh, got good. used to it. So you have some... I've got six more left. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, really? You have such a soothing voice. But I didn't always. Like, that. that's something that you build. Like, you look for the parts of your voice you like, you know, and and you kind of ex- you begin to, like, use them like a muscle. It's, it's a type mm. of acting, but it's like acting that's... It's like... But it's required to be naturalistic. But you have to work really hard to be natural. <laughs> And I think, I, you know, that's going in, you know, like, it's, it's like, it's just like, even though it's like, oh, you, you're effortless. You just look like you're, you're doing your, you know, no, it's like you're working very, very hard back to the circle of like, of performing like yourself, essentially. Hmm. And so hmm. the, you know, the, the tag at the top um, is, uh, is a little bit of a, is a tone setter because hmm. um, I always knew that the show was going to be about everyday and mundane things and when you're trying to convince people that that's an interesting use of their time you kind of have to put your arm around them and say okay no 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 really this is interesting this you have to look at this look closely at this and and i've always mic'd the show 
so that um, I'm really close to the mic. So it sounds like a voice inside your head. And so mm. the idea is that that the, the show voice is this companion that says, oh, no, no, check this out, like lean in and check this out. And so it sounds like you know, a bit whispered, a bit close, and it sounds like my voice in my head to me. And so that's that's all really deliberate. But it, it took a while to sort of like, I mean, that, that was kind of the idea from the beginning, but we got better at it over time. What do you think makes a good story? What is the anatomy of it? Well, I think you have to have good characters and good voices. Like we, we think about things in terms of audio. So I really like the sound of people's voices. So you put that up front, you know, something. Mm -hmm. And then you're looking for, you know, stakes and struggle. The, the, all this stuff like people kind of know. Um, you know, for us, I think with 99PI, we're always looking for an element that is about uh, decoding the world in some way. So we could tell you the whole story of a thing. But it isn't that you've encountered this specific thing in your life, but it gives you the tools to to notice that in the world around you. And that, that kind of makes, for 99PI story, what, what makes the story really work for us is that that the story, you know, goes with you, you know, and, and you take it into your life to decode mm -hmm. the world in a, in a good way and delight and see stories everywhere because of that story that we did. And that, that's the X factor that we often look for. Okay, so... Roman Mars is is basically describing his method in a way that's very similar to Gabriel Starr's theory. Uh, essentially, he's saying, come over here with me. Come here over here with me a minute and then let's go somewhere new. Um, and that's really that's what Starr means by restructuring of value. Right. It's like taking how you experience the world and giving you a new way to experience it. And then, and then think, and then notice that he's saying, and then you can take that into your life, right. And go somewhere with it. Now to do that, it, he be, like, he always begins with some kind of uh, sort of defamiliarizing description of something super mundane. And he takes an object and makes a story out of it. It could be a building. It could be egg cartons, uh, maybe it's bats. So it's like all different kinds of stuff like that. Um, I'm going to introduce um, a print version of of what I think of as really good storytelling from one of my favorite books of the last couple of years, Hanif Abdurraqib's Go Ahead in the Rain, Notes to a Tribe Called Quest. So in this book is, as its cover says, kind of a love letter to a tribe called Quest, but also to an era and a sound. Um, and notice that it begins with something very familiar. In the beginning, from somewhere south of anywhere I come from, lips pressed the edge of a horn and a horn was blown. In the beginning, before the beginning, there were drums and hymns and a people carried here from another here and a language stripped and a new one learned with the songs to go with it. It's very recognizable. We know what it is. Um, he's saying, we're going to start with this thing that we share, right? It's familiar to both of us. And then by the second sentence, he's already, he's already doing repetition with difference because it becomes in the beginning before the beginning, right? And so it, it, suddenly you've got a variation. He started to take you somewhere new. What's interesting is that you, it, it's like he gives us a grand history of a hip hop group right? But using this kind of rhetoric that we associate with other spheres. Hmm. But the thing you probably wouldn't know from necessarily just reading that, that opening bit is that he really moves between the lyrical and the vernacular in this very smooth way. In fact, I would say he enmeshes them. Um, so, and, and that's important to what he's trying to do. But if we just go through uh, the chapter for a minute, you see that We've got in the beginning, before the beginning, the next paragraph begins with another version of beginning with once mm. in America. Um, and then the next chapter, but before this, right? And, and so we're going back to another beginning. And throughout the chapter, it happens again and again. So on, on page four, in the beginning, I played the trumpet as a boy. So suddenly it becomes about him, but in relation to Miles Davis. And then on page five, and so in the beginning, I played the trumpet as a boy, and he gives us another reason to bridge the gap between my father and me. Um, 
And then on page nine, the first song of the low end theory, which is one of a tribe called Quest's albums, like their sort of breakout one, really. Um, it's another kind of beginning. And then on page 10, in the beginning, both before and after a new series of beginnings, right? He's adding another twist to it. And then at the end, it we get it begins first with what a people did to amend their loss in light of what they are no, no longer had at their disposal with an open palm against a chest or a closed fist against a washboard or a voice echoing into a vast and oppressive sky or an album teeming with homages. Here is the story, even without our drums, how with even without our drums, we still find a way to speak to each other across any distance placed between us. Essentially, what he does there is contextualize the story of a tribe called Quest in relation to American history, African American history, and the history of slavery, right? And the, and the art that came out of it. The writer is doing something that is analogous to what tribe did in their music. And that's important in terms of in thinking about a podcast between host and subject, right? Your tone and the way you tell that story is going to be very much, well, very, uh, like the, a technical term would be relational, but very much um, you want it to be in sync with your subject, right? Mm -hmm. Or with the other person you're talking to. And then notice when we go to chapter two, it begins once upon a time in Queens, right? So there's another repetition with difference right there. And that's just a key pattern in so much storytelling. So this is where he does it in print. And obviously it's very rhetorically elaborate. And I want to, and I want to think about similarities and differences when you move from one medium to, to the next. Um, so Abdur Aqib also has a really great podcast. It's called Lost Notes 1980. Uh, so Lost Notes uh, 1980 is produced by KCRW in, in, uh, in LA, which is a public radio station that comes out of uh, Santa, Santa Monica Community College. And each episode of the podcast is Abdur Aqib on a different musical artist from the year 1980. And we're going to listen to just the first like minute and 20 seconds of one episode. And the episode's about Grace Jones. I think the thing about 1980 in general was musically, we saw a lot of people saying, well, I'm going to just try something. I'm going to try something different because the turn of a new decade, I think particularly in 1980, really, I think, inspired people to think towards risk and rethink their relationship with failure. And Grace Jones was, was kind of perfect for that as someone who was consistently and constantly evolving herself aesthetically, sonically, creatively. Grace Jones just embodied so much. There's this thing that I hear Black women say a lot now that I, I kind of agree wholly with about how Black women are often creating towards a future where people will be checking for them more robustly. And I think Grace Jones is really in that lineage of someone who was creating for a future that people were not yet prepared for. And I think the first real step in that direction is War Motherette, which is not as celebrated as nightclubbing the album that came after it and maybe not as celebrated as living my life the album that came after nightclubbing but without warm leatherette those albums don't happen without her starting her work with the compass point all-stars those other two albums don't exist okay perfect anthony you wanted to say something yeah i also wanted to point out i think it's interesting and a great way to go about um telling using a personal story to talk about a larger topic mm -hmm. and the way he introduced it was really well as an, um, in the beginning, if that's like the beginning of this podcast and it's great to like, you give, you're giving your thesis basically exactly what you're going to talk about for the rest of the show in one sentence or yeah. like one paragraph. And I think he did that perfectly. Yeah. He does it really well. And notice um, he's much more efficient and concise in this audio format. Uh, whereas in in when he's writing, he get he just spends more time um, unpacking stuff, and there's in, and when he's doing audio, 
he's still combining the lyric and the lyrical and the vernacular, but the balance shifts much more toward the vernacular in the in the audio. I, I have a question. Okay. Uh, so, Jason, are, I, from what I'm gathering from this is that we like the like setting the stage is a very important part of is that is that basic this is what i'm gathering like the setting the stage is very important and you can set the stage not just by like what you say but the words that you use and the illusions that you make is that sort of yeah uh, i mean uh, but I, I what i'm arguing is that setting the stage is like an invitation to the audience uh, and the invitation includes something familiar now the, either something share either shared knowledge or a way of telling a story that's familiar, right? Either one of those two things. And then it's like the invitation is, and now let's go somewhere else. And when we go somewhere else, something's going to happen to you that changes you. Oh, right? That's awesome. That's, All right, that's, that's cool. cool. Right. Okay. So I, I want to open this up to discussion pretty soon. So we're going to go through a, a few more slides, but I'm not going to read this whole thing, but just... Um, this is Gabrielle Starr elaborating on her theory. Um, the thing I want to really emphasize here is that she uses words like flexible, distributed neural architecture, um, dynamic, constantly reevaluating, um, right? That in other words, I don't want to, there's nothing simple about this, but if you, think about like what she's basically done is worked with a team of neuroscientists and done fMRI research of people experiencing art. And she's demonstrating that what happens is that the art draws on a set of distributed brain networks and then takes them like creates a configuration that hadn't existed before. Right. So this is like the physiological version of taking you somewhere new and changing you. And then ultimately she argues um, that what the art can do is wrest pleasure from the unpredictable and refine continually how we imagine the borders between the world of sense and our sense of self. So how we're perceiving the world and how we're perceiving ourselves and it's kind of a loop and the stories involve you in that loop. Um, this is just to give you some, some examples of some of the work that focuses on uh, neuroscience and narrative. So each of these books represents kind of a moment. Um, Mark Turner, very early on in 1996, made this argument that story as a mental activity is essential to human thought. That basically we think through story. Narrative is how we think. Um, and then he collaborated with the cognitive scientist Gilles Fauconnier, and they they kind of extended this argument um, and, and coined a term conceptual blending and argued that it underpins both everyday thought and narrative experience. And essentially, it's like you take two concepts that you experience in the world, you blend them and you've got a new one. Right. Again, inviting you somewhere and taking you somewhere new. Uh, more recently, Carolyn Levine uh, has written a, in really interesting ways about how literary forms have an, have analogous uh, or are just literary forms and social arrangements use analogous what she calls forms, and that socio political experience is kind of defined by those. And she borrows a term from design theory that also gets used in cognitive theory called affordances to argue that any given form affords a new kind of experience. But depending on what form that is, it's a different kind of experience. So a podcast, let's say a storytelling podcast versus an interview podcast versus like a YouTube video, each of those affords a different kind of experience. But again, does something to you, changes you. Like, for example, a doorknob affords turning, right? Um, or a fork um, affords like stabbing or scooping. Um, a ramp affords wheelchair access, right? So then you could think about, um, or like a given law uh, affords rights. 
So it's right? something that makes a, a course of action possible for you. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And and I would say you you know, any given story creates a different set of affordances. Um and that it's not an you and you can't say it's so simply like and every medium gives another set of affordances because within the medium there's going to be variation right but um you know that's like is the story worthwhile if it doesn't make something new possible right why would you why would you want that story and it doesn't have to be some huge you know revolution it can be very slight but i think the idea is creating possibility for sure. Nice. Bernard. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to the affordance uh, idea as you explain it. Uh, it was a very, very long time ago. I took a class in dance and music composition as an undergraduate. So it was a really long time ago. And a, um, an assignment that we had really early on was to take an object as, for example, a bicycle mm. and come up with at least 10 things that could be done with it either uh, yeah. other than its intended purpose, yeah. use it as a musical instrument or something like that. Yeah. So sometimes where creativity comes in is to recognize totally. the affordance and then subvert it in some way. Totally. Yes. Uh, I mean, I think, uh, I think in, in terms of, uh, social relations and politics, but also art, like finding unexpected affordances in a particular object is just like a key social activity, you know? At, at, yes. And, and, and that's kind of where the fun is, honestly, also. Um, so this, I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples from my own work, and then we're just going to talk. So again, I want you to just think about what you anticipate. This is the opening of my memoir, the one you get. Um, and I will say this, this uh, opening was buried somewhere probably around page 12. And it was actually somebody else who said to me, this is how you have to begin. And it changed the story for me. So we're going back to my family and their tall tales a little bit. And I'll just mention that one thing I learned about storytelling from my family, I'm not going to say this is actually true, but I definitely learned it which is that profanity is very key in the telling of stories. That's a principle in my family. So here we go. Fuck the baby, I shout from the toddler seat of the shopping cart. It's my first sentence, announced with glee at Jonathan's, San Diego's most expensive grocery store. Nanny is taking my mom shopping to celebrate our new life without Charlie, my father, who's probably in prison by now. So the anticipation is set up like, where, what are we going to learn about this? How did this happen? I mean, I would hope also that simply like a toddler yelling out the phrase, fuck the baby. Like you want to like, what, what led to that being possible? <laughs> right? <laughs> so you know, yes, it ra raises questions. You know, it's interesting to, to me in this one uh, and about storytelling in general, right? Like, this is the beginning of the story. I'm not wedded to the characters yet. You know, I don't, I don't have an emotional investment, but why do I want to know why your father is in prison before I don't even know you or know to care or anything? I find mm -hmm. that, I find that interesting. Like I'm emotionally invested before I have any acquaintance with any character in this story. The family unit is shared knowledge between the reader and the writer, right? But it immediately strays from norms or expectations that we have around the family unit, exactly. right? In all kinds of ways. Um, so, and, and again and again, that's what stories do. And I want to just show you one other example. Um, so I got, I needed a break from writing about my family for sure. And um, um, I started making stories through video about my chickens. And there's actually a through line here, um, believe it or not, because I, I'm one of the things I'm just totally obsessed with is um, thinking about human beings as organisms in relation to other organisms, right? And so uh, that's one of the things that, that I liked. I, I like to think I'm exploring with um, my chicken storytelling. And I just want to show the opening of one episode. Uh, 
New lady came from Queens. Somebody abandoned her at the Queens Farm Museum. It's a great place, but they can't take in strays. She looked rough. We were pretty sure she'd been through something terrible. But she was plucky, she had gumption, and she seemed ready for her new life in the Catskills. When you introduce a new... Um, what kinds of anticipation is set, are set up there? A like rescue story? Yeah. It's going to be a rescue story, maybe a kind of hero's journey. Yeah. Um, and how does it do it through shared knowledge with, new, with difference? or repetition with difference. Is, is it that like, I know about the dog catcher, but I've never heard of the chicken catcher. So it's like yeah. it's something that I know applied to a situation where I've never seen it applied. So I kind of know it, but it's also weird. Yes. Uh, also, you know about chickens, but do you expect chickens to come from Queens? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so that's a, that's a big part of it. Like what's going on there. Um, yeah, it's like Chris is saying, it's like stranging the familiar. Absolutely. Like that's, that's what happens. But again, I just want to emphasize, then you have to go somewhere. You have to take the audience to some new place and hopefully change them in the process. Right. So I'm really just talking about how the hooks work. Um, yes, the mean streets of Queens. I mean, and, and there's a mystery there. What happened to her? We don't know what happened to her in Queens. All we know is that she looks battered. Right. And and something's not right. So what are we going to learn about that? So anyway, what I would really love is just to open up this discussion about storytelling. Um, anything, any observations about my observations or questions would love to take them. Um, thinking about going from one medium to another, what, whatever is on your mind. Yeah. So I, I, I'd like to start. I, I, I think I'm understanding this, but I want to make sure that uh, I want to make sure that I'm understanding this well. So I'm getting the sense from you that a good story is something that starts with something that everybody knows. But you, I keep on hearing things like defamiliarizing and unpredictability. So is the main point to take something that people know and then like throw a monkey wrench so that it strikes people like something's amiss and that's what engages them to stories is to like figure out the disjuncture between like something that they care about and something that's like not right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I want to emphasize that this can happen in all kinds of different ways. It's not like there's, it's not like it's an easy formula, but if you look at, if you look at good storytelling, you find that dynamic there a, a lot of the time. Right. And it's exactly what you just described. Like I recognize something and there's something wrong. Now so what? Like, right? So like a, as a practical matter in show planning, is it like, what do you do when you're writing for an audience? Do you like, you start with a topic and then you try to figure out what the audience would know and what would jar the audience. And you try to like hit them with a one, two punch on the way in the door. Like here's something, you know, and now I'll blow your mind. And now your mind to go for the journey. Is that, yeah, I mean, but I would say it's it's um, it's not so calculated. I think if you if you get that calculated about it, you're likely to end up with something that feels formulaic yeah. and not that interesting. So it, it, it requires intuition. Right. I mean, there's a lot of it that is there's really an interplay between in, intuition and intention. And I think that most good stories begin with intu intuition you feel your way into it and then you find the thing right what is that thing that's that's shared knowledge right and you may not name it but um yeah bernard is saying never start with an idea do you want to say what you mean by that i think i i think i know but um, i have I mean, no clue I, I read a lot of um prose and poetry submitted by people. And mm. uh, the overwhelming problem in much of it, aside from simply, you know, writers who just aren't interested in language and therefore don't write in an interesting way, is people who think that the point of writing is to have an idea and then explain it to people. Right. Now, even, you know, and Jason's a much more sophisticated writer about criticism and 
neurobiology and so forth than I am, but even in my fairly limited experience in academic writing, you you do not start out with the idea that you end with, or it's a completely dead and flaccid piece of writing. Writing is a process of exploring, and so is storytelling. And that's one of the reasons why spontaneity in storytelling is often so helpful that instead of I'm plotting this out, I you know record myself talking it or I talk it to another person. Uh, and then I come back and I, I refresh it. But that's what I mean is when you start with an idea, you are thinking that all the things that are of interest in writing are in service of making someone else think the same way that you do. Mm -hmm. And that is antithetical to the process of storytelling, which is, you know, yeah. Not to go on, but it is collaborative and you always need to think of it as a collaboration with the reader, the listener, et cetera. Yeah, it's a collaboration. That's a that's a great way of thinking about it. I think, Mike, you, have, you wanted to say something? You have a hand up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so part of the thing that always gives me trouble is, is selecting the details um, to start a story off also and so i know you have a bunch of chickens um what was the process of selecting the particular chicken and was it based on very particular details that you already knew would create a good story and also is yeah. is the is the hook usually a detail that that you draw upon this is just i guess more of like your process of yeah, I mean, so it, again, it's back and forth between, well, I would say like, I'll add a third element, intuition, intention, and accident. So part of it would be like, oh, I got this amazing weird shot. So what is what can I do with that, right? And that shot is suggesting a new way of approaching this that I had not anticipated. So, so with that particular one, the thing about I, I mean, you know, the hook is like this chicken came from Queens to live in the Catskills. That's but there at first I was thinking what what unfolds is that it's about her integration into the pecking order. So you learn something about chickens and pecking order. And at first I thought that was the story. But then what ended up being the story is that this particular chicken didn't really subscribe to the idea of the pecking order actually she's operating outside that system and that's what i saw through the footage that i collected over the series of months right so the story went in a new direction you know like you do you need to be prepared to follow it i think you know it, it's rather than fully script it um and I, you know i would say that the same thing is true in written stuff i do the same is true in interviews I do for podcasts. Like what moment did you get? And how does that help you redefine what this episode's going to be, right? And maybe you're gonna, a lot of, a lot of podcasts will do the thing where um, the host will introduce something and then a little clip of audio that comes from later in the interview just comes in in a kind of abrupt way and that's like a hook, like, oh, we're going to go somewhere that, to this place that I don't understand yet. But the process is about getting there, you know? Yeah, Chris. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this. It's been inspiring and insightful. Uh, my question is about, because I know, Jason, you um, have written um, a wonderful, I really love your nonfiction well, your book, which again, it, it borders on everything. Right? Actually, I actually, I shouldn't have closed on fiction. <laughs> Technically, it does a lot of really inventive thing as a, as a, as a book. Um, how, would, how do you see the difference between how this particular um, insight about narrative that you're sharing, how does it work to you differently or the same maybe when it comes to fiction and nonfiction? For example, as a fiction writer myself, what you're saying mm. to me resonates so much because I see it more easier, more directly, or more sort of like immediately in fiction I've read. And so many, whether it's all good stories, whether it's a YA story or a good fable or a long, big novel, like what you're talking about, I can see that happening. But mm -hmm. I'm curious as to how that works for like a podcast that's like a podcast about, um, about reparations, you know, or a podcast about some big social 
a political issue that I'm sure they're doing the same types of things, but it's not really the same, it's not the same genre. It's, you know, you're yeah. not working with a character I could create that did this crazy cool stuff and I could invent, you know what I mean, all these other aspects. So I was curious, right. like, how do you see these things being related? Yeah, I mean, it varies, but there, in, a, in, a, in a podcast that's about, let's say, c- contemporary politics, often the beginning is something very much like what Joe described before, some kind of social rupture or, or injustice, right? And so there's a problem and what are we going to do to understand this problem and where do we have to go to start understanding it well, right? So I do think there's a parallel there in terms of what you're talking about. Thank you. Yeah. Ryan. This is very interesting to me and especially someone who's uh, been interested in stories and their roles in sociology, which is kind of maybe mm. a different angle. Yeah. But then some of the things you said are, are, are exactly the way we think of it sometimes, the way that you said how literary forms and stories can underlie social arrangements mm-hmm. and you know, sociopolitical experience. Mm-hmm. And that's something like we've done some work in, in, in sociology about how stories can make action possible. Right. They can kind of create identities. Right. right. And mm-hmm. is, is that kind of a good way to see this? Like your, your story about the hens or your more, you know, related, your more autobiographical stuff, is that setting up kind of a, a picture of your identity kind of, or is that a way that, is that what authors are doing when they're kind of creating these stories? Like, you know, am I, am I far off on this? I, no, I think you're right on. I think it's, you know, as a sociologist, you do that with very explicit intention And if you're working in narrative, you're feeling your way through it more. Um, But a similar thing happens. The only thing I would add is, is that hopefully you're doing that for an audience as well, right? In other words, like the action isn't just about the right, like the action that becomes possible because of the story isn't just uh, for the writer, but for readers, right? Or for audiences, depending on the medium. Um, Like, hopefully it does something to change them or make something new way of thinking or being possible for them. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. The other way you're putting anatomy, you know, like creating an identity, but not just for yourself kind of, so everyone could see something about family or taking in strays or, you know, what the overall kind of a story coming out of it is. Does that make sense? That's interesting. There's a nice connection there with sociology. I think at least we're looking at a different level, I guess, but more abstractly, you know, but um, it's similar process. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, just like there are some thing like I've had responses to my memoir that are surprising, some that are not surprising and some that are like, um, you know, young queer kids have responded really enthusiastically and said, this is important to me for these reasons. And that's sort of obvious, but also like, a 75 year old Korean woman came up to me and said, like, I feel like you were describing my childhood. Right. And it was like, I didn't expect that. Our experiences are, are geographically, culturally, and linguistically really, really different. Right. But she found something in there to identify with that did that for her. Did you mean that? Was that surprising to you? Or was it was very surprising. Like, it know? was very surprising to That's me. But when she described it, it made sense based on the way she described the connection. You right. know, uh, but, you know, I mean, hopefully you can't predict how audiences will respond to your work. You know, you want you want there to be unpredictability there, I think. Hmm. Interesting. OK, thank you. Mike, I'd be super curious to hear more about your um conceptual metaphor theory and conceptual blending oh yeah the so the the guy that you had put the books up for mark turner and uh yeah gilles fauconier yeah 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 yeah. i think mark uh turner also has another publication with a dude named lakoff who yeah has the book metaphors yeah. we live by, which which yeah. is basic, which is basically yeah. how we uh, deploy metaphors in everyday life without even thinking about it. Like, mm-hmm. for um, example, his I think his famous example was like uh, having an argument. Right, it's based on 
a certain degree of violence. And we always talking about like, you know, shooting another person's argument down or, or, uh, Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, th those kind of things. That's, it's always violent. And he suggested, what if we conceptualized arguments as part of a dance, um, where mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. we trade positions and we're in communication, whatever, you know, um, it was those kinds of theories that I started thinking of like, oh, wow, we deploy all of our storytelling using analogies to, you know, other things like the in the beginning example you had. I, I was mm. like, a, a lot of people are going to position that in relation to some kind of myth or or, right. or whatever, as we were talking about. Yeah. Um, so it, it almost becomes like a framing immediately you step into that framing once upon a time you step into a framing yeah. um and then it just it affords uh the possibility to think of everything that comes after that in a certain way it doesn't determine it but it makes right. it so much more possible so yeah, much yeah. more likely that you're going to go in this direction right. um so yeah the conceptual metaphor theory conceptual blending stuff uh, i was i was all about it i'm I'm excited to see that new, new book that you put up there. Um, I haven't read that one, but that's definitely going on the reading list. Yeah, she's definitely taking it in new directions. Um, but so Mike's a, ling not everyone knows this, but Mike's a linguistic anthropologist who has a really great YouTube channel called The Social Life of Language. Um, yeah. I did. And I think what you before. said about it, about, um, like the, a metaphor or a narrative or whatever it is um, affording possibility, but not determining it is very it resonates a lot with what Bernard was saying before about how you can find like different, you can find unexpected affordances in any of these things like, mm -hmm. you know, and playing around with those, I think is a lot of the work of what an artist does too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm struck as a non humanities person how loaded word choice is it's something that a scientist doesn't think about you often think about the action underlying the words and you're not thinking about the the words as a vehicle like you think of them as a vehicle for delivering a story but all that matters is the story and when I listen to you guys I get this sense that like word choice is an enormous part of crafting the experience mm -hmm. and that you choose words for effect uh, it's it's very it's something that not everybody thinks about. It's it's kind of foreign to someone like me, but it's it, it it's an interesting insight that I'm getting from this. Yeah, uh, it, like for example, another really powerful metaphor metaphorical framing is Darwin's uh, theory of evolution. It's all using a capitalist type logic, like in competition with one another mm. um, all the framings if you were to just if you were to replace the word you know evolution with the marketplace the book would still make sense you know mm. it, mm -hmm. it it's very strange um, but that but that's the way it happens like every day like everything that comes out of us is you know mediated through some kind of metaphor or analogy or whatever yeah i mean Abdur Akib is really um, artfully uh, writing with that as, as like his, I guess, a method. And essentially what he's doing is taking, taking those like overly familiar kinds of phrases and then revising them so that they make some kind of new possibility, right? Like um, in the beginning, before the beginning, suddenly you have, you've got a different worldview there, right? And then by the end, we've got like, he, he offers like multiple beginnings and suddenly it's like, oh, this isn't a story about uh, that there's one origin, that you can't find one origin. In fact, it goes in all these different directions and, and it puts you in a completely different philosophical frame, but just by playing with that familiar language. In your work on sort of the neuroscience of storytelling, is it is it that the human brain just gets pulled to things that it can't figure out? Like, is it that the human brain gets pulled to anomalies and that's what writers are capitalizing on? Uh, 
that is a i mean when i write about well, well okay this is gonna be a long slightly longer answer but uh there that's often how people who do that kind of writing think about the relationship between the narrative and like um pleasure and reward systems in the brain so right like something novel is going to make you feel like you're getting a reward um i actually don't i'm interested in in that writing um but i don't actually like i i just can't believe in in singular theories i just don't and so much of that writing is about singular theories so what I've done instead is write about how writers and artists um, respond to research about the brain with, that offer ways of thinking about it that doesn't necessarily come out of the science or offers new directions for the science or, you know, so I do more of that. So just a, a couple of things, because I know you want to wrap up soon, but one is almost reiterating what I said earlier, and in contrast to something that somebody else said, yeah, I think you, you do think about the medium and you start with the medium. The, uh, you know, I'm not just saying that the only way to fail as a storyteller, a podcast or a movie and a written word of fiction or an oral storytelling, or, oral storytelling is to start with an idea. But when, uh, when you have a film about uh, miners on strike in West Virginia, that's a good film about miners on strike in West Virginia, it's because it's a good film, mm -hmm. also because of what it informs mm -hmm. you about. Yeah, yeah. And so sociologists for, may not always be consciously aware of how they're storytelling really well, but you can always subject sociological writing to critical reading if... Derrida does it and it's post-structuralist and it's deconstruction, you know, they call it deconstruction, but what it is is critical reading, which means that you pull out of it the metaphors, uh, the sort of unfair tactics that have been used to fool the reader, et cetera. Uh, and that's been around, you know, for some time now, just an extension of the old fashioned critical reading. So you can do that with other people's work. You can do it with your own, but it's kind of a, aside you to uh, some of the stuff about enhancing our podcasting skills and having a community, which is what really interests uh, me most of all. I would like to mention, um, you know, I know it's very well known, but if people haven't listened to Shit Town, yeah. um, that, you know, because it's, it's often held up as a standard, but one of the things that it does is it changes the focus with every episode. You don't yeah. know Right. what's coming and that's you know it's very exciting yeah. and and it is the story of the subject of the story but it's also the story of the storyteller <laughs> whatever his name was he did that <laughs> he did that extremely well so it's an interesting thing to think about that as an, <clears throat> an unusual storytelling tactic if you're interested in keeping up with these programs and other ones that we're going to be running uh join our join our email list queenspodcastlab.substack.com or write to me joseph.cohen at qc.cuny.edu so uh, thank you very much Jason uh, this was awesome thank you it was it was fun it's a pleasure oh. all right it's always we're a pleasure here oh I, I, I love doing these for a moment if uh, any of you are joining us on YouTube uh, and uh, you are enjoying this series or any of the other series that we uh, run, know that this is a nonprofit, public, uh, 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 free, uh, not for profit set of resources created by uh, Queens College. Uh, these are your tax dollars at work. Uh, we're funded by the city and the state of New York. Uh, if you would like to support us in all that we do, this programming, the scholarly content, the learning experiences that we produce for students and the public, uh, please consider visiting our website, queenspodcastlab.org, clicking that donate button. If you do, a tax deductible donation through the Department of Sociology will go to, uh, at the at Queens College and the City University of New York. It will uh, uh, help 
fund uh, everything that we do. And it also tells people higher up that they appreciate the kind of uh, work that we do. So if you like what we're doing and you want to support us, uh, visit our website.